Hello there, my name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Like most anglers, over my fishing life, I've witnessed very obvious changes in fish distribution, numbers and average sizes. Change is usually seen by people with an interest in catching fish, be the anglers or commercial fishermen, as being inevitable, and more often than not for the worse rather than the better. That said, personal observations, anecdotal evidence and general banter regarding decline, while they can be useful as primary indicators to set alarm bells ringing, have absolutely no scientific basis whatsoever. And unfortunately, when approaching policy makers, or those people who do actually have the power to bring about change, particularly where the emotive subject of votes or people's livelihoods are concerned, the moment it's claimed that there is a problem, hard evidence to back up those claims will immediately be called for. A frequent problem when attempting to demonstrate fishery decline is a lack of baseline data upon which to build a sustainable argument. Provide that, and your case immediately has a foundation upon which to lay the rest of the debate. With that in mind, Dr. Ruth Thurston, who's a postdoctoral research fellow working in marine fisheries, joins us for this particular podcast in what has to be the longest range interview audio angling has ever conducted. When I first became aware of Ruth's work on collating and analysing commercial pressure data, going right back to the mid 19th century, in order to produce an environmental baseline for the management of marine fish stocks around the British Isles, I thought I would be driving over to York University, where those data were being used as part of a PhD thesis. As you can probably imagine then, when the university returned my email with a new address in Queensland, Australia, I was, to say the least, a bit dropped on. I didn't know whether to press the send button again, or abandon the idea completely. Obviously, I'm very pleased to say, in the end I decided to press send. So for the benefit of those who aren't familiar with your work, can you first set the scene by explaining the basis for your UK PhD project and how, after completion, you're now undertaking similar work on behalf of the Australian government and their coastal fisheries? My PhD was based at York University and the idea behind my research was that contemporary fisheries management tends to make decisions about the health of fish stocks and the health of the marine environment more generally on the basis of quite short-term data. So, say, data that spans a 20, 30, 40-year period. But, of course, intensive fishing began many decades before this, and we've been fishing our seas for centuries. So we recognise that, really, we need to turn to other sources of information to build up a picture of what is natural in our seas. And often, as individuals, we recognise that things have changed throughout our lives, but we don't always think about how it might have changed during our parents' or our grandparents' lives. And this is called the shifting baseline syndrome. That's how it's been termed. And it's where we perceive the degradation that occurs over our lives, but we don't really take into account that intergenerational shift and that degradation that might have occurred over past generations. So we see maybe a small change, but really different generations have always seen small changes and that adds up to much bigger change over time. And as a society, we don't really accept that this happens either. However, it's important to have knowledge as to how things used to be during perhaps our earlier lives or before people alive today were born to set appropriate baselines for fisheries management and and also to understand whether the recovery targets that we're setting at the moment are actually appropriate, particularly if a species has been in decline for a long period of time. We also need to know whether a marine ecosystem has been so dramatically altered that there's not much hope that it will go back to what it was. And of course, we need information like that to make decisions as a society. Of course, as a society, we want to eat fish and many of us choose to buy it in the supermarket rather than going out and catching ourselves. So we need to decide what level of impact is acceptable. And we can't do any of these things without knowing just how much we have altered our marine environments from their natural state. So to do this isn't particularly straightforward and you tend to need to use Uh, lots of different sources of data. So as a result, my PhD work was quite diverse. One of the earliest pieces of work I did was looking at the Firth of Clyde on the southwest coast of Scotland. And so for that, I basically looked at 
long-term landing statistics. And then to try and go back earlier than that, I looked at various historical sources of information, fishery reports from the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, and try to really build up a picture of what fisheries used to be targeted, what numbers of fish they were catching, and how this changed over time. And what was interesting and really quite sad about the Firth of Clyde is that, of course, there's still life there and there are some beautiful areas. But in general, what had happened was the level of fishing had become more and more intensive over time in order to keep these catches coming in. And whilst they used to fish for species such as herring and also for bottom fish like cod and haddock and also flatfish like turbot and brill, These fisheries, under pressure, appear to really gradually decline. Uh, Really quite early on, there were signs of this at the turn of the 20th century. And then as these fisheries declined, different fisheries came in, for example, for langoustine, which is a prawn that they use in scampi. And in order to get these, you need to trawl, and you need to trawl with relatively small mesh. So, of course, once these fisheries came in, you would catch other species as bycatch, but essentially it means that you're harvesting ever more intensively. And really kind of at lower and lower levels, you start at the predators and then you switch to the prey. And now uh, the Firth of Clyde is at this point where many of the fisheries are fishing for invertebrates that are quite resilient to intensive fishing pressure. But it just means that there aren't as many species. If these fisheries go bust, there's not as many species for people to fall back on. So a Firth of Clyde, by all accounts, seems to be at really a tipping point. But that isn't recognised unless we look further back in time. I also did some work on looking at UK fisheries more generally, and I basically took some ignored fisheries landing statistics that date back to 1888 and in fact a a few years before that as well but from 1888 you can get this wonderful time period which shows you the landings and also the numbers of vessels targeting these fish species and basically you put all this together into this long time series which is government data but doesn't really tend to be looked at because they prefer to get other types of data for stock assessments But basically what we found was that since the 1880s, if you corrected for these increases in fishing efficiency over time, because of course over time we've got much better gear, we can go further out to sea, much better technology, the commercial productivity of these fisheries reduced by 94% over a period of 118 years. And what this basically means is that fishermen today have to fish about 17 times harder in order to catch the same amount of fish that their counterparts were catching 118 years ago. So really what this implies is that there has been this really quite astonishing decline in the availability of bottom fish such as cod and haddock, and really this quite possibly a profound reorganisation of the seabed and the ecosystems on the seabed since uh, the 19th century, and this is when we industrialised fisheries. And from then on, what I have also looked at is data even earlier than when we first started collecting fishery statistics. So we first got fishery statistics on a national scale in the 1880s. But before then, fishermen had already been fishing quite intensively along the coasts of the UK and out into the North Sea. And so there were royal commissions of inquiry conducted long before statistics began to be collected throughout the 19th century. And... What I found was by analysing these witness testimonies, these are fishermen speaking, they recorded word for word what they were saying about what the changes they had experienced over their lifetimes. And so even before we really truly industrialised our fisheries, they were seeing declines in inshore areas. So these changes that we're talking about have been going on for decades really and at least since the early part of the 19th century so these are the sort of changes that we're having to deal with and that so far have been by and large very much ignored by management and at the end of my PhD I was lucky enough to get a job in Australia and this is with the University of Queensland and I'm currently in Brisbane and at the moment I'm focusing my research efforts on pink snapper 
which is the only fin fish species in Queensland to be classed as overfished. However, there's enormous public and political debate over this because they don't have too much long-term information. And again, there's so much uncertainty without this long-term information. So I'm basically just trying to gather more information to help inform management of this species. And it's a species that is enormously important to people. It is an iconic recreationally fish species. It tastes beautiful and it's a species that many recreational fishermen when they want to go out that's a species that they want to target so it really does have a place in people's hearts here so I think it's very important that there's more information and hopefully my work will be of use in both protecting and also setting more appropriate baselines for management. Would you agree then that the most important data here is the historical stuff dating back to the 1860s, as this presents a series of snapshots in time with which to compare the situation we're faced with today? Yes, I think the 1860s onwards is an incredibly important time in the history of fishing and also an important time to look back at to compare contemporary fisheries with. And The 1860s was really important because this was when fishing using the bottom trawl began to intensify quite rapidly, and there were several factors that contributed to this throughout the 19th century. So in the early 19th century, they started the building of the National Rail Network. There was also, um, throughout the 19th century, there was a rapid increase in our population. And towards the later part of the 19th century, steam was introduced to fishing. And these three factors together meant that a lot of changes occurred very, very quickly and really increased our ability to catch fish. So with the the National Rail Network, what happened was once they had started building this, it connected a lot of these coastal towns with large inland centres of population where people were in desperate need of protein. And it created this market that couldn't be filled by the line and net fisheries particularly easily. They needed lots of fish and they needed them relatively cheaply. And this is where the trawl came in. And the trawl really, as a result, started to spread around the UK um, because of this increased demand for fish and because they suddenly had a market that they were able to ship to. And, of course, as the population kept growing, this demand kept increasing. Unfortunately, though, although trawling really began to expand uh, around the UK during the early part and the mid part of the, the 19th century, they didn't start collecting statistics until the 1880s. So you've got this quite long period of time that you don't really have any data for. The exceptions to these are these royal commissions of inquiries that took place uh, where they asked lots of fishermen about their experience of fishing and how their experiences had changed over the course of their lifetime. So these are really the only in-depth data that we have on fisheries before fishing statistics began. And they give you a very good indication of what was occurring, both to the fishing communities and also to the marine environments as trawling started to expand and started to fish in all these, these new areas. As well, over this period of time, you got the introduction of steam in the 1880s, but even before then, fishing gear had been really increasing in efficiency, particularly with trawls. Their boats were starting to get larger and not just limited to trawls. Gear started to increase in number and in size, so people really started to improve their technology. So with steam, you got this massive leap in technology that enabled people to go further offshore, and enabled them to fish in grounds that they hadn't been able to target before. And all this occurred in really a very short period of time. And since then, we've continued to do that. We've continued to improve our technology, and we've continued to kind of fish further afield until we were really stopped in later years as people expanded their territorial boundaries. But the early effects were really quite extreme, and uh, some of the descriptions during the 19th century very eloquently put some of the changes that were occurring in marine habitats and on the seabed into context. Comparing catch data from the 1860s to the present, there is a very obvious and undeniable negative correlation between the technical evolution within fishing and progressive decline of those fish stocks it was exploiting. There is definitely this negative correlation between, yes, the technical evolution of fishing and the decline of fish stocks, However, the problem with 
fishing more generally is as people will know who go recreational fishing this this technological creep that occurs so over the years first of all people's skill improves but then also you get these additional technologies so 20 or 30 years ago we we started getting gps before that you had sounders and then at some point you got plotters and so you get all of this new technology and the same thing occurred 150 years ago as well so even in the 1860s, people were talking about the changes to the fishing gear. They said that they would get bigger beam trawls, for example, or they would use more hooks on a line, or they would have bigger nets. So this technological creep, this increase in fishing efficiency has always gone on. And what happens is a lot of the time, this can actually mask declines in fish stocks. And it masks them because we can effectively fish harder. And so we can keep those fish supplies coming in. Another way that we mask declines to fish stocks is by cereal depletion. So this is where we might fish out one ground or, you know, temporarily cause declines in one fishing area. But then all that happens is that these days we can move further offshore, we can move to increased depths, and we can continue fishing and continue those supplies of fish coming in. And so really these increases in efficiency have been going on for decades and they really do mask fish declines up to the point where you can't go any deeper or you can't get any further out or you can't fish any harder and then these declines start to be more obvious. So with the UK, say the trawling industry, the commercial fishing industry, what has happened is that over the years during the 19th century, for example, they would fish the North Sea. They'd fish all around, but I kind of, I know a bit more about the North Sea in particular. So they really expanded across the southern parts of the North Sea and over to the east during the kind of the, the mid 19th century. And then in the later parts, they started expanding to the north. And this was the trawling effort. And then really by the turn of the 20th century, trawlers were by and large fishing the northern North Sea, but they were also making these exploratory trips up into the Arctic where they would get absolutely enormous catches of bottom fish. So then we shifted a lot of our effort up to those northern grounds, particularly England. Scotland really carried on fishing kind of the northern North Sea. And then of course people will have heard about the Cod Wars and what ensued as other people increased their fishing effort and we started fighting over these territories then eventually we were sent scuttling with our tail between our legs back to our grounds. And by this point, it became a lot more complex because then we had started having these quotas imposed because people had seen that really we couldn't continue fishing the different fish stocks indefinitely. But essentially, the fisheries productivity within the North Sea and around the UK had very much decreased compared to the 19th century. And this is really for many fish species, and I really am talking about, in this particular instance with the bottom trawls, the fish species such as cod and haddock and, and whiting and the flatfish species as well. Those are the species that we have recorded in the fisheries landing statistics. But of course, there's many other species that we didn't record. So in the landing statistics, for example, they'll say things like skates and rays, but until very recently, they never distinguished a different species. And so species such as the common skate is now incredibly rare. And that's because of trawling, because it, its life history means that it can't cope with the high mortality that has occurred as these more invasive fishing techniques have spread. What this does tend to do within areas is it means that the, the mixture of species that dominate areas actually changes over time. So you get a shift to these more resilient species, and that would be animals that breed quickly. They don't grow to big sizes before they mature, and they mature quickly as well. So they're incredibly resilient to high mortality rates. And so these sorts of species start to be favoured. And of course, with some fishing techniques, such as bottom trawling and, say, dredging, that can also affect the habitat on the seabed. And of course, the habitats change as well. They shift from what might be organisms that are quite vulnerable to fishing, such as horse mussels or oysters, and these will eventually be replaced by very quickly reproducing organisms on the seabed, or maybe as well animals that burrow, so they're less disturbed by the fishing pressure. 
So you get over time these huge changes, but they might happen so gradually that we don't really realise that they're occurring. And what they did see, though, in these long-term landing statistics are when the two world wars occurred, essentially all fishing had to stop. A little bit went on, but most of the trawlers, for example, were requisitioned for the war efforts and very little fishing occurred because it was just too dangerous to fish. And what they found was particular species such as place and also other bottom fish species in general, the landings shortly after these world wars just exploded. They really, really increased even after a few short years of stopping fishing. And this is really some of the best evidence that we've got today of the impacts that we are having on our fish species. It's clear from your work that from a fish population and density perspective, one trend in particular stands out. That being the impact on fisheries and on other methods of fishing by the development of the bottom trawl as its use spread around the British Isles. The bottom trawl has really been incredibly important in the development of British fisheries. Actually, it's the earliest recording of the use of the bottom trawlers is dating back to the 14th century when fishermen went and complained to the king about this instrument that was destroying the plants of the sea. So it has been used for many centuries, but until about the 1820s, 1830s, its use was limited to a few localities, largely around the south coast. And then the National Railway Network began to be developed, and this resulted in an explosion of bottom trawls because it developed this market in inland cities for cheap supplies of fish. And before this, fish had really been quite a luxury product because it was largely caught by lines or by nets, and it perished very quickly. And there were a few hardy species that some people could afford to eat when they were transported inland. But other than that, it wasn't really eaten huge amounts by people far inland because it took too long for the fish to get there. So all of a sudden, when these network of railways came in, you got this swift, reliable means of transport, and they were able to transport fish to populations in inland cities who desperately needed some sort of protein. These populations were growing as well throughout the 19th century. So basically, the trawl expanded around the UK throughout the 19th century, and in the early parts of the 19th century, it expanded throughout the southern parts of the North Sea. They were exploring new grounds, um, bringing in huge catches of fish at times. And then that kind of expanded throughout the north of England and into Scotland throughout the kind of the middle of the 19th century, 1860s, 1870s time. And this created uproar because other classes of fishermen, so the line fishermen, the, the net fishermen, the pot fishermen, they did not like the trawl. It encroached on their fishing grounds, it destroyed their fishing gear, they saw it as taking away their markets, and they also saw it as a really, really destructive method of fishing. So there was this complete uproar, and because no fishery statistics were collected at this time, the only thing they could do was set up these royal commissions of inquiries where they, they went around and spoke to fishermen about the changes that they had perceived had occurred. And of course, you get very polarised views during the 1860s. You have the trawl fishermen who are perceiving these huge increases in their catches because they're going out to these virgin fishing grounds that have never been fished by trawl before, and they were catching these huge quantities of fish. And then you get the line and pot fishermen who are really being, first of all, forced out of their favourite fishing grounds, and also just seeing this huge destruction that was really quite upsetting for a lot of them. But nevertheless... The trawl was seen, particularly by those in power, as providing a cheap source of protein that otherwise couldn't be got for this rapidly expanding population that they didn't know what to do with. And it was also, as well as this cheap supply of fish, it was also seen as a way to get more sailors for them to improve their navy. And they didn't really think about the fact that there might be limited supplies of fish. There was just this feeling that there was always going to be fish. And if they ever did fish out grounds, which they weren't sure could happen, they could move off to other places. And so this was really the attitude that prevailed and has really prevailed for many, many decades since then. Of course, that isn't really the case as we are finding out now. Then basically they started eventually collecting fishery statistics in the 1880s. And interestingly, this was from calls by some quite big people in fisheries. So the people who were taken notice of were the people who owned multiple trawlers and big trawling companies. 
And what had happened was by the 1880s, these men had, first of all, started off fishing themselves and then had started managing these many trawlers. So they had a vested interest in this industry. And what they had found was after years of being involved in this industry, they were actually witnessing declining catches. So between the 1860s and the 1880s, there were actually these declines that occurred. So they were calling for protections of inshore fishing grounds, so protection of the three-mile limit. They were happy not to trawl within these three miles because they felt that this was areas where fish bred and they were important areas for feeding, so they thought they should be protected. However, there weren't very many statistics to back this up by then. So this started the collection of national fishery statistics What also happened in the 1880s was the introduction of steam power. So these calls by these trawl fishermen to say, can we protect our fish docks? All of a sudden, the technology got such a big boost that these declines really got masked again because people were able to move much further offshore and fish unexploited grounds. And this continued really up until the 1960s and the 1970s when once again we started to see these declines through a mixture of factors and partially because we were getting pushed out of grounds that we had traditionally exploited up in the Arctic. But then when we went back to our North Sea grounds they really weren't as productive as they used to be. And then of course fishing power from other countries had also increased and really we were just fishing the sea so intensively by that point that the productivity really had fallen off. One thing anglers are very good at is apportioning blame for all the ills that beset them, and in that regard I'm probably no different. So let's cut right to the chase. With regard to whaling fish stocks, it's time to point the finger. Who is to blame and for what? Well, I think that's a very good question and a very important one, and actually quite a difficult one to answer, because I believe that most forms of fishing have some level of impact, but of course it's up to us to decide what level of impact is appropriate. And of course, that's going to vary a lot depending on the species and their vulnerability to fishing. Also, perhaps the habitats that are there and how much fish that we actually want to take out of the oceans, our demand for fish, and also the type of fishing that we undertake. Some species might be quite resilient to, say, line fishing, but as soon as you start using these more invasive forms of fishing and you start altering the habitat, then these species don't stand much of a chance after that. So there's all these factors to consider. And... I think a couple of points from that is that we really can't make decisions as to what sort of level of impact is appropriate unless we know what sort of impact we're having. And we're only going to know the level of impact if we have this historical data and we have some kind of long-term context within which to put the changes that we're seeing. We can't understand what it is that we've lost or we are in the process of losing without this. And so I think that's important I also think it's important to understand that the way fisheries are being managed at the moment is really not conducive to long-term sustainability in many cases. And this is because we tend to look at them in the light of short-term changes. So we might be considerably underestimating what has happened to the abundance of species over time, for example, or how much a habitat has changed over time. But that also goes for how we look ahead and how we manage fisheries and how fisheries are often managed is very short term, looking into the future as well. So a lot of decisions are made by politicians, for example, who have a very short term view on things more generally. And also votes are important to them. So they're not always going to make decisions that are required, but, you know, they might be unpopular. So uh, they, they probably shy away from those more often than not. So I think that if there's going to be any finger pointing, I think that the main finger pointing has to be at the way we manage our fisheries. And we really need to have some sort of fundamental change in our thinking as to how we manage fisheries. Also to what we manage for. So do we manage for one particular species or do we manage for the ecosystem as a whole? And managing for the ecosystem as a whole is what I think is preferable, but it's very difficult to do because we don't have lots of data So in those cases, we often have to make decisions based on the best available data, which might not be particularly robust all the time, but it might be all we've got. So there has to be these shifts in thinking and how we defend the decisions that we make. So I do think it's the most important change that have to be made is how we manage fisheries and really as well what our aspirations are, because actually what we want for our marine environment might not be all that it's capable of providing and um, we need to kind of have those baselines reset in order to manage 
fisheries properly and sustainably in the future. From what you've said, it seems that the development of the bottom trawl was the first major step on the slippery road to decline. Why then do you think that that lesson is not obvious to current policy makers? I'm not advocating the end of bottom trawling, but surely there are measures such as open square box mesh as opposed to collapsing diamond mesh that could allow more of the unwanted elements of a catch to escape. I think the lesson is not obvious to current policy makers because they don't look far back enough in time, so they see what is occurring now as perfectly normal, whereas really it shouldn't be. I think in terms of how to make the bottom trawl less destructive, there are measures that can be taken, such as adding in the open square box mesh. And that has been found to be very effective, but I think often there's not enough... Well, there are plenty of regulations in place when it comes to bottom trawling, but how effective they are at protecting unwanted elements of catch is sometimes questionable. And I think the problem is when you add in things like open square box mesh, it can get rid of some of the unwanted catch, but I think it also there are problems sometimes, as in it will get rid of some of the wanted catch as well. So new regulation like that is not always the most popular and easily implemented unless it actually goes into law. And I know that the fishing industry, for example, um, have worked hard in the past to try and make their fishing gear less destructive or at least more efficient. The problem is, is that regulations such as, as those, such as the square mesh and larger mesh, don't really help in terms of altering the habitat. So there's not really much that you can do. If you're going to trawl on a vulnerable habitat, then it is going to be altered by trawling. I think really the only thing that can be done in those cases is where there are areas of vulnerable habitat still, we don't trawl. And we have different forms of fishing that aren't going to be quite as altering or quite as destructive to particular habitats. And there are habitats that are very resilient to trawling. There are some that can be trawled over a lot and they don't change too much, such as shifting sands or muddy bottoms as well. But then in terms of shellfish beds, they're all very kind of delicate beds. So there might be areas where they have sea pens and species such as that, then they don't deal very well with the effects of trawling at all. And in those cases, it's really those first few passes of a trawl that do the most damage. So even if you trawled in an area much less, that doesn't really alter the way the habitats are impacted to a great degree. So I think that there has to be more to it than putting in measures for the mesh, although I think that those are very important to implement, but they will help in one way, but they won't always help a broader range of species or, for example, the big bycatch like skates and rays that they won't necessarily be wanting to catch. But there's not very many ways around that. With irrefutable scientific data available to show where so-called advances have actually worked against us in the longer term, as well as unequivocally demonstrating numerous downward trends, for the UK, as part of a European Union where we're not free to set our own objectives, in your considered opinion, what does the future hold? Well, I think it's difficult to say what the future would hold for the UK alone, or even the EU as a whole, without considering what's going on in global fisheries more generally. I know that the common fisheries policy is not particularly popular and it has let us down in many, many ways. I'm not particularly qualified to talk about the UK and its place in the European Union. I don't know enough about that to really hold an opinion on that. But in terms of fish stocks more globally, the outlook is pretty poor if we continue down the path that we are currently on. So I've had a look at long-term fishery statistics for the UK including what we're importing and what we're exporting. And then I've had a look at that for the world as well. And what you're finding is that these days, the UK is currently consuming more fish than it really produces. It imports an awful lot of fish. And the EU does as well, as well does the US also imports a lot of fish. Even in terms of what our government or government advisory bodies recommend that we eat, that doesn't tally with what our fisheries can currently provide. So they tell us to eat two portions of fish a week. But if everyone did do that, we wouldn't be able to provide that ourselves. And I think that is quite a serious disconnect where policymakers have not really considered the implications of their guidance. So I think we really need to look at it 
at a global scale because it might be the case that in the future we can't eat fish which we consider important because it's a healthy alternative to meat but in other countries there are people who actually rely on fish as their major source of protein so when it gets to the point where we perhaps can't continue to import all of this fish they really will be continuing to be malnourished and more malnourished than they are today so i think we need to start looking at fisheries and the state of fisheries more globally and actually considering the impact of our choices upon developing nations or nations where really the major harvest are fish also the fish that we're eating when we import them from other countries we don't always know how sustainable these methods are and that that doesn't just go for wild fisheries that also goes for aquaculture fisheries so a lot of these prawns that you get these huge prawn farms will often have had enormous social as well as environmental consequences in the countries where they've been set up they might be cutting off access to the sea for people who depend upon fish for food they also tend to very much pollute coastal areas and i'm sure people will have heard about mangroves being cut down and really coastal areas the mangroves disappearing in order to put in these prawn farms these shrimp farms and other types of fish farms as well so Again, I think it comes down to what level of impact do we want to have? And of course, we're going to change the system in some way if we choose to eat fish as a population. But I think we need to look at it in terms of what's appropriate both for the UK, but also more globally. And that can be quite tough because it's not always clear where our fish comes from. And supermarkets in particular have been getting much better in the last few years. So you can track to a certain extent where a lot of fish are coming from. And and I know in some supermarkets you can even look at how they are fished, whether they're trawled or whether they're caught by line and whereabouts they're from. So I think basically making informed choices is a good start. And I think if everyone started doing that, then the future would look a lot brighter. And I think that is happening but we are going to have to start thinking about it more globally so beyond the EU to the countries where we are rather cheekily taking a lot of their fish and whilst we have standards in this country we don't always abide by those same standards in other countries in theory though often less so in practice catch quotas can be a good thing unfortunately it seems not all quarterback fish species caught contribute to the actual quota figure being used for these scientific calculations Commercial boats under a certain size, which it has to be said are the ones most likely to exploit inshore stocks, are often not included. Would it not then make more sense to include everything, including anglers' catches? Then as soon as a quarter figure is reached, the species in question can then be left to replenish itself. I think it is important to have an idea of how much is being caught in total. And so, yes, how much is being caught by everyone, including commercial and recreational fishers. I think that in reality, the practice of that is often hard to achieve and often people don't particularly like the idea of all their catch being recorded and then them perhaps being stopped from fishing. However, I know in some countries you do have a significant number of anglers and in those cases, I think we at least need to know roughly how many fish are being taken out of the sea because that way we can make more accurate assessments of the health of fish stocks. I think in terms of stopping fishing as soon as a quota is reached, that's difficult because many of our commercial fisheries, at least, are mixed fisheries. So a trawl won't just go and pick up one or two species, it will pick up quite a few species. And this is one of the the problems that they have in fisheries management. And it is a major problem is that they might reach their cod quota, but they haven't reached their haddock quota. Then they can continue fishing and they will continue to pick up cod as well, I think probably depending on which areas they are in. So I think in practice, it's very, very hard to implement. But I do think it would be of great importance to have a much better idea, at least to start with, of how much fish is being caught in total, particularly in countries where recreational fishing is a significant proportion of the catch, and which you do get, say, in some places like Australia, for example. There are a lot of recreational fishers, and uh, you, you can get significant quantities of fish caught so just to have an idea of the total number of fish would be much better than we have got at the moment can i suggest two examples of where perhaps the uk might well take note of the efforts of others if we're to have a sustainable balanced inshore fishery 
The first is Iceland, with its unilateral 200-mile exclusion zone that sparked off the Cod Wars of the 1970s, the other being Norway, which is not an EU member, and insists that the bulk of its inshore fishing is done selectively, using lures and lines. I think, in terms of benefiting the UK, I think we would do very well to have a look at best practice examples from around the world because there are many fisheries that can be sustainably managed and they are sustainably managed and so I think in terms of say Icelandic fisheries and Norway's fisheries I think we can learn a lot from them. I think it is difficult because we aren't always in charge of fisheries. We have to make decisions within the framework of the EU But I do know that there are people working in policy in these places who are are working very hard to try and create sustainable fisheries. And I think whatever they decide to do, that it's so important that we do start to make changes very soon. Because otherwise, I think our fisheries are are not going to be able to replenish. And of course, although you do have years where people say the cod catch has improved and the stocks have improved, In terms of long-term change, those improvements can be very minor. And again, that's where this long-term context, this historical context is really important, just to see that those improvements that they're seeing are really very small compared to, say, with the cod stocks that they used to have. One question I would very much like to ask, though I may well be directing it at the wrong person here, is how, with a declining commercial fishing fleet, can we still also have declining fish stocks? Well, I think the main point here is that our fishing fleet, there might not be the numbers that there used to be, but in terms of other countries as well, there's there's a lot of fishing taking place in fleets from other countries. And also possibly the most important thing is that our fishing efficiency, so that technology, has improved so much that we are able to fish much harder than we used to be. And... Also, our fishing methods have changed. So back in the 19th century, we had ice. So you could only go out for so many days before you had to return because otherwise your fish would go off. Whereas now we have freezers so people can stay out at sea. They can stay out at sea for much longer periods of time. They can continue fishing. So the way that we fish and the intensity at which we fish has changed dramatically. I can't remember the exact figures, but I know there has been work done in the past where they've looked at how much capacity we have in the seas and our commercial fishing fleet and I think we are still at over capacity so even if we reduced the fleet even more we would still be able to catch what we catch now with those fewer boats so really in terms of numbers of boats it's more to do with the power of the fishing fleet as a whole and through this technology and also the ways in which we fish. Before you left the UK for sunnier climes, you will no doubt have been aware of the big debate stirred up by TV chef Hugh Fernley Whittingstall regarding commercial discards. Even if you're not, then discards, either through overquarter catching or due to undersized bycatch mortality, are obviously a very real problem. But is allowing commercial fishermen to land everything they catch to prevent this wasteful process not a recipe for further disaster? Or are there safeguards available that could prevent that from happening? I think the question and the issue of discards is a really important issue, but it's a pretty complex issue as well, and it's not something that I would ever pretend to know the answer to. I think that the TV campaign that is going on is is really, really important, and, and I think we need to find some way to reduce discarding. And I think perhaps putting that into legislation is the way forward, and it definitely seems to be the way that a lot of very knowledgeable people think and agree with. But I think, yes, safeguards would have to be put in place because what you don't want to do is just to continue fishing and then have all of this bycatch just to convert to fish meal or to process in some way because that's really just transferring the problem on. You're not really dealing with it then. Now, I know in places such as Norway, a lot of the time they have these real-time fishing closures as well. And what it means is that if they go and they catch a certain proportion of undersized fish within a catch, and that happens so many times, they have to move on to different areas. Therefore, they stop targeting areas where there are a lot of undersized juvenile fish species. So I think there are safeguards like that that can be put in place. And I think if we're going to stop discarding, then we're going to have to be careful that we don't just transfer 
the issues that we have into a slightly different problem. But I think there are ways around it. And again, I, I think looking at countries such as Norway and perhaps Iceland, I think they might have some answers as well in terms of that. And finally, with your knowledge of the data and its trends, what lessons from the past would you highlight to fishery policy makers if a turnaround from the current decline is ever realistically going to be achieved? Well, I think that's a good question. And I think there's quite a few things that we can do. And in fact, some of these are already underway. So one of the first things I would say is that we need to replace this short termism that seems to occur in fisheries management with longer term goals. So as I described before, we can't have politicians just thinking about the next few years, we need to have them thinking about the next few decades. And that's going to be a difficult thing to achieve whilst we manage fisheries the way that we do. What we can do, though, is we can go the other way. We can look further back into the past and make decisions based on long-term trends, not short-term trends. So that is easier to do. It's not always perfect data going back into the past, but if we can build up an illustration of change, it gives us something to base decisions on. I think, as well, something that I would highlight to policymakers is that we can destroy fisheries. For example, the oyster fishery in the Firth of Forth, it was there for centuries and centuries, and within... A matter of decades, our fishing activities became so intense that we rapidly destroyed it. And now there, there isn't really any way back from that. We can also cause severe declines in even non-target species without even realising it. For example, the common skate, nobody noticed for years that that was in decline until it was almost too late. I think as well, in terms of that, we need to start thinking about the broader ecosystem rather than single species. And we've always considered single species in fisheries management because that's a much simpler way to go about it. It's still not simple, but it's simpler than thinking about the ecosystem as a whole. However, now we are getting the computer models that we require and, and the data to some extent that we require to think about our marine environment more holistically. And so fisheries management needs to start moving towards that and it already has done to an extent i think policymakers need to recognize that too though and i also think just in terms of the work that i've done what's clear to me is that we need to start aligning policy advice with what our seas and what we can realistically produce not just what we can import unless we're going to start thinking about our fisheries in terms of what's going on in the world as a whole so i think that policy advice needs to get up to speed. They are aware that fisheries need to be more sustainable, but that hasn't really changed the way that people go about encouraging people to eat more fish. And we need to improve our marine environment and our the capacity in our fisheries and the productivity of our fisheries before we start talking about how much fish we should be eating for health. And I think finally, we do have a chance to turn things around. All is not lost. But I think that we are going to have to make some relatively painful decisions and accept that we're going to need to use everything at our disposal to improve the outlook for our fisheries and the marine environment. There are lots of different management tools. So we shouldn't just limit, for example, tools in trawling to, say, putting in square mesh because that might help some species, but it's not going to help others. So we might also need to implement spatial tools, like saying that we can only use certain types of gear in some areas. So the more vulnerable habitats, maybe we shouldn't have such intensive or destructive levels of fishing. I would say that other than by looking into the past, really, the only other way that we can begin to see what our seas are capable of producing is by protecting some areas and stopping invasive activities. And I wouldn't say that we want to do that for all areas of the sea because various industries use our seas and the resources in them and we enjoy using the resources in them as well. But I don't think it's too much to ask to have areas where we can chart the recovery and the changes that occur when species are not targeted. I think it's an, an interesting scientific experiment and also that the findings might surprise some people. I think if we do this, that we have got hope for the future of our fisheries. I think, if I was an optimist, I might feel a little bit heartened by all of that. But as a long-in-the-tooth realist, I know only too well that the possible outcome and the probable outcome are unfortunately much more likely to be poles apart. From what we see on TV with campaigns such as Hughes Fish Fight, public appetite and support for positive change appears to be ahead of political will. Or is it perhaps that those focused on the issues are more vocal and willing to stand up and be counted than the apathetic majority? And while the concept of ending discards and setting up marine conservation zones is excellent in theory, 
I personally still see all sorts of pitfalls, particularly with the discards by insisting that everything caught has to be landed. It's one thing wanting to stop indiscriminate waste, quite another coming up with a sound working solution that doesn't replace one bad practice with something potentially far worse. Conservation zones are another problem area. I have a seat on the Inshore Fisheries Conservation Authority and when questioned, even our Chief Executive Officer was unclear about what these would deliver. And it was equally unclear as to whether angling and non-destructive commercial fishing methods might also continue to be permitted. And even if they were, went on to express concerns as to whether these zones might ultimately be hijacked by Brussels and given total exclusion status. As ever, history will be the judge. Speaking of which, the historical context of what Rufus had to say here has been an absolute highlight, which in itself shows that the problems we see today were recognised as far back as the 14th century. And more than 600 years later, we're still talking about them. My thanks then to Dr Ruth Thurston for this summary of her PhD project work.